are shaping the way we teach English webinar course, brought to you by the American English team. I hope you've seen our website for teachers and learners, AmericanEnglish.state.gov, which is one of the places you can find English Teaching Forum. Go to the home page of American English and look toward the top. You will see English Teaching Forum. Click there to access the journal. English Teaching Forum is a quarterly academic journal for English teaching professionals and is written by teachers for teachers. Raise your hand if you have ever read an article in English Teaching Forum. We got a lot of fans. The easiest way to read Forum is by getting print copies. Check with your RELO or the U.S. Embassy in your country for information on how to get print copies. But there are also many ways to find what you are looking for on our web page. You can click on Past Issues and search for specific volumes by year. Our website has all forum issues dating back to 2001. That is over 150 articles and more than 50 lesson plans or classroom activities that are ready for you to use in your classrooms. You can also search forum by keyword. So, for example, if you want to find articles on teaching grammar, you can type grammar into the search box. And you can search by different pedagogical categories, such as assessment, large classes, or motivation. Or you can search by skill, such as critical thinking, vocabulary, or reading. Or you can search by audience, such as adult learners, teens, or beginners. Now, Let's take a look at what's in each issue of Forum. Each issue contains four or five academic articles written by English teachers for English teachers. We have had authors from over 135 countries. The articles increase your awareness of a spe specific topic, and they also give practical applications for your classroom. In Forum, you will also find a feature article related to a specific aspect of American life. Feature articles include colorful pictures that you can use in your classroom. The Classroom Activities section contains two or three activities, each activity for a different level with easy-to-follow, step-by-step instructions. And finally, in the back of every issue is the lighter side, which is a language learning puzzle also related to the feature article topic. It's easy to reproduce, either on the blackboard or as photocopies. It's great for warm-ups or using at the end of class. In addition, we ask you to contribute. If you have classroom techniques or ideas you'd like to share, consider submitting an article. You will find detailed instructions on how to submit an article on the submissions part of the website. So please visit us at AmericanEnglish.state.gov and check back often because we are always adding new content. Another way to stay up to date with American English is to like us on Facebook. Now let's turn our attention to the webinar. Today's webinar is entitled, Activate Games for Learning American English. Have you heard the saying, give a man a fish and he will eat for a day? teach a man to fish and he will eat for a lifetime? This webinar and new resource Activate Games for Learning American English embody the essence of that saying. First, we will introduce you to classic games that have been transformed for student-centered speaking practice. After you play and learn about the games as language learning tools, the webinar will guide you through the process of designing new games, paying special attention to the potential for open-ended speaking production. I'm glad to tell you that today's presenters are Kevin McCoy and Jenny Hodgson. Good morning. Hi. They are both part of the American English team. Kevin and Jenny work together to develop Activate Games for Learning American English because they believe that everybody loves to have fun, even while learning, or maybe especially while learning. Jenny is a materials writer and was previously a teacher in Togo, Costa Rica, Spain, Malta, Poland, 
and Washington, D.C. Kevin is a regional English language officer in Washington. He has taught in many countries, including Yemen, Russia, Belarus, Moldova, Jordan, and South Africa. So, everyone, please say hello to Kevin and Jenny. Thank you, Tom. Thanks so much, Tom. Kevin and I are really excited to be here. Kevin, I don't think there's a better way to start today's webinar than just to play. So, will you play a game with me? Yeah, well, games is our topic, so let's get going. All right. So, do you have a dice? Yeah, I got my bag of toys here. You can hear, I think. Okay. And I've got my die. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'm just going to time this because I want to see how long this game takes us. Okay. All right. Let's get started. You so, go first. Yeah, roll the die. One. Okay. I'm going first. All right. So what someone does hmm, in a movie theater. Um, Someone eats popcorn in a movie theater. That's one thing. Okay. Your turn, Jenny. Six. Oh. One, two, three, four, five, six. At a birthday party. At a birthday party, people eat cake. Mm-hmm. My turn. I got a two, so I'm going to move one, two to on vacation. On vacation, people go to the beach. I agree. Well, if they're near the water. <laughs> <laughs> three. One, two, three. In China, people visit the Great Wall of China. Mm, good one. My turn. One. In I a think I'm going to win. No, you're not. <laughs> In a car, um, people, a person hits the brakes okay. when they're in a car. One. Oh, no, go back three spaces. One, two, three. On a tropical island, people relax. Mm, good one. Four. One, two, three, four. In a forest, um, in a forest, a person walks through the trails. One, two, three, four, five, six. At a wedding, people get married. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Or it's not much of a wedding. Oh, man. Uh, oh, one. Where am I? I'm in a forest. Now I'm in China. Okay. Oh, we've already done this one in China. But no, I think... Because we're different people, we could probably have different answers. So I think it's okay if we land on the same space. Okay, good. I'm glad you brought that up. So in China, um, a person eats delicious food, like noodles. Like Chinese food. <laughs> Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. When late for an appointment. Look how close I am to the finish. When late for an appointment, people often speed to try to get there faster. Mm-hmm. True. Um, two. China. And now I'm in a kitchen. In a kitchen, um, someone washes the dishes. Oh my gosh. One. <laughs> when sick, people take medicine. Mm-hmm. Oh, I got a one, two. Um, on a large ship. On a large ship, people read books. Because it's a long journey. Yeah. Okay, well I got a three, but I can only go to the finish, so I think that means I won. So I'm going to stop the clock, and we just played that game in 3 minutes and 11 seconds. Yeah, for the record, I really don't think you won. <laughs> you just finished first. Okay, fair enough. But So I think that's, you know, something that if teachers didn't have a lot of time to spend on a game, it could still be something that is played in the last 5 minutes of class, but it could also be something that is, is you know, used for an entire lesson. Right. Uh, this is actually a board game. So something that you put on a desk in front of you. And rather than play with the whole class, play in groups. So let's take a poll. Have you ever played a board game like this in your class? 
And how often? Looks like we got a good mix. We don't have a lot of people playing often. No, we don't. And we have Kevin... quite a few people playing who have never played, about one-fifth. And then here, what are the obstacles to playing board games in a class? And you can choose more than one answer here, because we know there might be more than one obstacle. Look at that. Too many students. Too many students. Hard to get all students playing. Teacher loses control. Noisy. Not in the syllabus. Games are not serious learning. And classroom management, hard to move desks and chairs. Those are all really reasonable things for um, teachers to consider. And you know that might be an obstacle to playing games. But I hope that we're going to be able to address some of these issues today. We will. One thing I think it's great that teachers think that games are serious learning. No one, most people don't uh, disagree with that. Good. All right. So as you can see, today's webinar is about games, but specifically about our new resource that is free and downloadable. It's called Activate Games for Learning American English. And Kevin and I are so excited to be talking to you about Activate and about games because we love teaching and we love games, but most importantly, drum roll, we, we love fun. fun. <laughs> Kevin, do you think it's rare that people like fun? I mean, I think you and I are a little bit strange in a lot of ways, but I think that in this case, we're most people like fun. So let's, yeah. let's find out. Let's take a few polls about fun. I had an uncle who liked fun. Really? Just that one <laughs> uncle? <laughs> Let's see how you feel about fun. All right. So do you love fun? 100% so far. Do your students love fun? 100%. Do you think your students will enjoy learning more if it is fun? Oh, we finally got a no vote for fun. <laughs> <laughs> There's someone so, out there that doesn't love fun. All right. Um, and do you think less learning will take place if students are having fun? All right, so here's where we're a little bit divided. Um, I think still most people believe that learning can take place even if students are having fun, but some people are a little bit worried if they're having too much fun, maybe learning isn't taking place. So I think we'll talk about that also today. We are. Yeah, we will. There are two different issues, I think, fun and what appears to be noise, I think. Right. So, there are many components to the Activate resource. You just saw one of them, that game that's called What Someone Does. And these are actual resources that you can print. They're available at AmericanEnglish.state.gov at our website. And you can print these board games. And you're looking right now at several examples. Some of you may have already played them. Raise your hand if anyone has played one of our Activate board games. Oh, good. We see Amal has played. Has anyone else played these games yet? Safa? Great. What else do we have, Kevin? We also have in the Activate Games for Learning American English suite, we have Picture This. And you'll see these are card games. And the cards have two sides. One side has images. The other has questions. And we have lots of different games you can use these for. Don't worry if you can't see the cards too clearly yet. We're just introducing them, and we'll talk about them more in detail. And you can download them for yourself later. You can. DIY. I know you know what this means. Does anyone know what DIY means? Do it yourself, yes. Uh huh. Jenny and I really like this attitude, do it yourself, because teachers can tailor their classroom to their needs. And in this webinar, we're going to be showing you how to do do it yourself games as well as introducing you to games available in the Activate collection. I see someone from Yemen saying that this game is great for young learners. But, and I agree with that, it is great for young learners, but I think it's also great for pretty much any age learner. Um, 
as you saw earlier, Kevin and I, who are well above young learners, love fun and love these games, and we are adults. Yeah, and you saw that we laughed when we were playing the act, uh, What Someone Does game. We Absolutely. enjoyed playing it. Absolutely. All right, so we know that your classrooms come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, different levels of learners, different age learners, as we just talked about. Um, and we even have different lengths of time that we can spend with our learners. Some of us have just 50 minutes once a week. Some of us may meet every day. Um, so we understand that you know every classroom looks different. Let's. Um, I would like to know which of these images looks most like your classroom. Let's take a poll. Classroom number one um, is a very large classroom, and the students are sharing desks. Usually two to three students per desk and they are sitting wow. in rows. Look at that. So this is actually a classroom in Togo in West Africa. Um, the second picture is a small class and the students are sitting in a square all facing in so they can all see each other and the teacher. This one's in the US. In classroom number three, this looks like a medium-sized classroom. Um, every student has their own desk, uh, but they are also in rows facing the front. And then the fourth picture is also a medium-sized class. Um, every student, again, has their own desk, but in this case, they are uh, facing each other. So their desks are in small pods so that the students are in small groups. So if you would like to describe your classroom a little bit beyond just the poll, one, two, three, or four, we see that the majority of you have a classroom similar to number one, so you have very large classes in rows. Um, so we see, oh, some of you have a small classes. Um, from Burundi, we see that your class is, is very large. Yeah, that's a problem, not just in Burundi, but in much of the world. And we feel for you. We understand that. Exactly. Okay, so let's go back. So we know that all of your classrooms are different, that the one-size-fits-all approach will not work. So instead, we're here today just to share some ideas, but our suggestion for you is to visualize your classroom throughout this webinar and think about how you can make this work in your classroom, and we're going to give you some tips as well. Okay, so let's um, start talking about the games. The first step is for preparing the games. Um, the first thing you'll need is dice. But if you don't have any dice, no problem. There's lots of ways that you can make dice alternatives. Here in this picture, you'll see that there are six pieces of paper folded up, and they have one, two, three, four, five, six written on each piece of paper. They're put into a bag, and then students pull one of the um, numbers out. And this is very easy. Students can actually make these themselves. The teacher doesn't have to um, make all of the bags of dice. If you look in the picture on the right, that's actually just a little Kleenex bag that I used, well the students used. They ripped up one little piece of paper and wrote one through six. So students did not have dice, so we just make them. And you can see in this picture on the left here that we're just using a coin. You can flip the coin. One side means a player of the game would move one space, the other side of the coin would mean the player moves two spaces. But not six? No, the number doesn't really matter, right? No. In fact, students play more if you use one or two or three, so it really doesn't matter. Also, we have a die template here that is available online. It's on our website, right? Yes. Yeah, and all you have to do is print that and cut along the lines, and you, or better yet, your students can fold that and make a die out of paper. Yeah. In fact, there are many ways to make alternates to dice. If you use your imagination or even your students, you see that one on the top, it's a pencil, and pencils happen to have six sides. And I actually learned this trick from a student in Russia about 12 years ago, and I've used it ever since. And there are some other alternatives as well, and I bet you can think of some, or your students can. Just 
give them that problem to solve. Yeah. The other tool you'll need if you want to do board games, as we are going to do in a moment, is game pieces. These are to represent each player in a group, and they will move them along the board game according to the number that they roll on their dice. So you can see right here on the left, what's on that game board, Jenny? I see an eraser, a pen top, a coin, um, another maybe eraser, and a cap to a water bottle. Yeah, so basically we're just using any old token that can be found around the classroom in someone's pocket or in a purse. I always carry a bag of things, paper clips and plastic toys and things that yeah. I can uh, give to students, but they can find tokens themselves, right? Yeah, Kevin always has his bag of game tricks, but I, on the other hand, never do. Um, but <laughs> usually I just quickly give my students 30 seconds to find their game piece, and usually they do it with, in 20 seconds. Well, I really like Jenny's strategy because when there's a, something to be solved, give it to the students. Yeah. You know, let them do it. They're perfectly capable. Gives them confidence. I just played with a group of teachers, and some of the teachers use their earrings, rings, their coins in their purse, anything. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, good. Another game. Yay. So after we get our game pieces and our dice, the next step is showing the students how to play. And there's two ways we could do this. We could give instructions, or we could model. I'm going to do a demonstration of both. So I'm going to give instructions. Today, class, we're going to play a game, which one would the world be better without and why? In this game, you're going to roll the dice, and you're going to move your game piece, as many numbers as the dice tells you, and then you're going to talk about which one the world would be better without and why. The first student to get to the end finish line is the winner. Okay, does everyone know how to play? Kevin, do you know how to play? I think so. Uh, I think that that was probably a little bit confusing, especially for lower level students. Um, when we give lengthy instructions, sometimes students can stop paying attention or forget or might not really understand. The so, other th sorry, Jenny. Jenny asked, does everyone know how to play? I said, I think so, because students will, won't tell you no. Yeah, of course they'll say, yes, I understand they're listening. Yes, and it can be done with higher levels. You can just give oral instructions. But even in that case, um, I still think giving a model is a little bit better because then they actually see what the answers are going to look like as well. So they really know that they're doing it right. Mm -hmm. So let's try that. So I'm the teacher, and Kevin is my student. Hello, teacher. Kevin, can you come to the front of the room? Yes, I can. We are going to play a game. I'm going to go first. Rolling the dice, I got a four. One, two, three, four. Sugar, guns, hospitals. Wow. Which one would the world be better without and why? I think the world would be better without guns because guns hurt many people, and I don't think that we should have them on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, teacher. Can you try one now? All right, the teacher demonstrates. Now, I'm the student. I got a six. One, two, three, four, five, six. The whole class is watching us. My choice is traffic, computers, or doctors. Which would the world be better without? Well... I'm going to surprise you. No one likes traffic, but I'm going to say computers because I think that we are becoming too technologically advanced and people are just looking at their computers all the time. We need to look into each other's faces sometimes, too. Thanks, Kevin. That was a great example. So, okay, class, are you ready to play? Okay, so we're going to play this game now with you. With you. All right, so let's get ready. All right. So I'm going to roll the dice first. And you are going to play. We'll determine what space of the board. All right, so I rolled a four. One, two, three, four. Okay, so 
Share your answers with us. Which one would the world be better without and why? So don't forget to say why. So it looks like most people think that guns would be the one that we should get rid of. And some people say sugar and 1.7% say hospitals. I would like to know why someone is saying hospitals. Okay, so guns hurt people, guns kill people, people will not kill each other animals, so this is all guns. Okay, I saw someone talk about sugar and say that it causes diabetes. That is true. That's that a worldwide true. problem. Yeah, and you know, I'm not sure, but I think diabetes kills more people in the United States than guns. Definitely. Okay, so sugar is not healthy. Um, no guns, no murdered people. I want to hear about the hospitals. Who selected hospitals? Guns hurt. Not everyone has access to guns, but sugar, it's cheaper than guns. That's very true. I really hate oh. guns made of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> guns bring violence. Mur okay, good. It's important to note that we respect all answers here. If students say why, they are allowed to express whatever opinion they want. The okay. important thing is to say why. That's more language practice and more thinking practice, right? Exactly. There isn't a one right answer. and that This game is purposely designed that way because we want students to think critically. Sometimes it's going to be really hard to pick one, um, but it, which you know encourages critical thinking. Okay, so I see the hospitals. As long as we do not need them, there will be no need for them, no wars, no disease. Okay, so that would be in an ideal world we wouldn't have hospitals. Great. That's cool. All right, I'm going to roll again. And I rolled a four again. Wow. One, two, three, four. Okay, plastic bags, hunting, or clocks. What do we think? Now what the, do you think, Kevin? It's funny because these items seem like they have no connection to each other. But that's what I think is fun about the game is that we can choose any of them. I'm going to have to say... As much as I don't like plastic bags, I'm going to say the world would be better without hunting because you know I love animals. Um, and so I think that we should be helping and animals live rather than yeah. hunting. I'm going to say plastic bags because I think there are so many and they're completely unnecessary and they're actually also killing a lot of animals by polluting the ocean and lakes and rivers. But we have a lot of good answers here, so we yeah. see... What are people saying about clocks? I'm interested. I saw someone say, I don't like to see clocks when I know I'm late. <laughs> that was funny. That's a great answer. Yeah. yeah. So plastic bags bring pollution. Um, plastic bags are useful to carry things, but they can be destroyed. It takes a very long time for them to uh, go away. So uh, plastic bags to protect the environment, so we should get rid of those. Uh, clocks, because we would be free of time constraints. I love that. You know, I think that's a really important idea and I think we're that's thinking a, about. That's a really creative answer. Mm -hmm. um, plastic, because they spoil the environment. Uh, maybe you don't have to hurry when you don't have clocks. Yeah. Clocks so that people would have more time having fun. I love that. Yay, Abby. <laughs> um, okay, great. So let's roll again. What do you think I'm going to roll? I think I'm going to roll four again, and I did. One, two, three, four. Okay, let's see what we have to say about laws, borders, and shopping malls. So which one would the world be better without and why? I want to hear why. If we didn't have any... Wow, no one is saying laws. I might have picked laws. Well, you're going to have to tell me why then. I sometimes think laws, there's too many laws, and people might... Be, think more for themselves if they were able to think about what was right and wrong. But if we didn't have any laws... Yeah, it probably would be a little chaotic. Maybe just less laws. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we see most people are saying borders. Very interesting. And a lot of people are saying shopping malls and just a few are saying um, laws. So we see here no shopping malls. We could spend time with the family instead of wasting time at the mall. You could always go to the mall with your family. <laughs> Kevin, what do you Many think? People what, do. what would be your choice? Well, uh, I, d I like the idea of a world without borders where people, where artificial lines do not tell us where we can go and where okay. we can't. So I saw someone say people would be more tolerant of other people's cultures and traditions without borders. I like that answer. 
borders. It's about time people had the chance to come and go wherever they want, whenever they want. Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah. Um, if there's no law, there won't be peace. So this person's not picking laws. Um, let's see. What would the world be better without? We have to be tolerant. We don't need borders. Shopping malls kill family spirit. Okay. Yeah, again, if I think if it's important that if a student... If students were playing this and they chose an answer that was unpopular or didn't match your own, that's okay, as long as they say why. Exactly, and this this could really spark conversation if students, you know, get stuck on one question and talk about it for a while and talk about their different answers. That's okay because the point of this game is to communicate and to pr practice authentic um, conversation. All right. Do you guys think I'm going to roll a four again? I think I'm destined to roll a four again. One, two, three, four. All right. Which would the world be better without and why? <laughs> Plastic. Plastic, fire, or oil? Boy, that's... No, this one's getting harder. I think that's a really hard one. Because people obviously are saying plastic because plastic... There's all sorts of bad things, but there's plastic in almost everything you own. And I think oil, if we're talking about gasoline, um, if, if we had never had gasoline, the world might be very different. Yeah. So I might pick that one because it's also harmful for the environment. As someone said here, it causes a lot of traffic. Um, it costs us a lot of money. Someone else pointed out we get plastic from oil. <laughs> True. Yeah, and someone's asked here, does oil mean gassier? And guess what? Oil can mean whatever your students want it. Maybe they just think it means cooking oil, and they're going to choose plastic. So again, it's there's no right answer. Um, students are encouraged to interpret this in whatever way they like because we want them to be creative. All right, so I think we understand this game. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, I think we understand. All right, so let's go back. In fact, I bet there's some other ways we could play that very same game in a, in a different way. I bet you're right. What should we do? Should we play again? Well, in Activate, we have a teacher's manual. In the teacher's manual, there are many variations for every single game. So you can play them more than once. Okay, so here's what the variation looks like in the teacher's manual. So the same exact board game, but now we have completely different directions and even examples of what the students will say. All right. So in this version of the game, we're just changing very simply. And you could do this on a board game if it's on your students' desks by just putting a post-it or a piece of paper over it and writing a different title. This gives us a different game. So now it's ranking. That means the person who lands on the square will say one, two, and three and rank them. But it's better if we demonstrate, right Jenny? I agree. So let's try it. Let's try. I'm gonna roll the dice one time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're laughing because I rolled a four again. All right, let's see. So one, two, three, four. And guess, there it is. Sugar again. Guns Hospitals again. So I'll answer it just very quickly. Uh, the importance in my life, well, um, well, none of these is very important. I'd say sugar is most important <laughs> right now <laughs> because I'm trying not to eat any. I don't have any guns, and I hope they don't affect me. Um, I'm going to put that number three. And hospitals number two, I also hope I don't see them. These are three things I, don't, I hope I don't see very much. Good. All right, so important in my life, number five, hip-hop, volcanoes, and police. Well, for me, um, I'm going to put police as number one because I really like to feel safe, and I know that when there's more police around, I feel safer. Um, I'm going to put volcanoes as number two <laughs> because um, I think volcanoes are a symbol of nature and how delicate nature and the environment is. So, and I really like nature. 
So I'm going to put that as number two. And number three, hip hop. Um, I love music, but hip hop is not my favorite kind of music, and so I'm going to put that last. So this is a completely different way of playing this game. Um, different language is being practiced. We're thinking about all of these words in different ways. Um, and again, there's no right answer. Students are free to be completely creative here. Mm -hmm. So look at all these, um, all these answers that we have here. So Zarina says police one, hip hop two, volcano three. Um, Aladia says volcanoes one. Um, but don't forget to tell us why. That's really key for the teacher here, for to ask students always why. Um, I know in some places they have volcanoes that are um, a great tourist site, so it could be more important in some people's lives than in others. So, yeah. um, some in, places for example, are very dangerous. In, in Costa Rica, there's a beautiful um, area surrounded as, that is surrounding a volcano, so I could see that it could be important to the people that live there. Mm -hmm. So. This may seem like a strange activity for students, right? But we do want them to think, don't we? And this game requires them to practice thinking, but in a non-threatening way. And practice speaking um, without having a right or wrong answer, so creatively and authentically. Exactly. And someone asked, have the students been taught the these different themes previously? Um, I don't think there's necessarily a theme, but yes, students should have some language ability to be able to play this game. So they should be able to rank things. They should be familiar with most of the vocabulary. Um, this is really a, a conversation practice game. Alright, so we said earlier that we love fun. Um, did, these, did these games look fun to you? Let me know. Um, but there's something that Kevin and I love even more than fun, if you can believe it. No. Could it be? We like easy fun. <laughs> we, might, we might be a little bit lazy. Um, and we know, we are both teachers, we know that it can be really challenging uh, for teachers to not only worry about lesson planning and worry that their objectives are being met, that their students are learning, um, but then in addition you have the stress of trying to make the classroom engaging and fun. We know that's a challenge. So that's why we're here today. Um, what's better than fun is easy fun, right? And that's what Activate is all about. Um, we provide you not only games, but an easy way to make your own games. So, uh, one way that this is very easy is that you can just download the games from our website. Um, and they're completely free. You can see that we have instructions as well as a template for making your own game. And if you want to see some more ideas on using Activate Games, there's a teaching tip of video with some more instructions. Uh, you can also scroll down the page and you'll see the list of games that we have on our website. Currently there are eight available and three more are coming soon. So here you can see that you can download um, not only the board game that you saw, but also the instructions. And remember when we showed you that variation? The instructions are also included there for all the variations of the game. So even though there's only eight board games here, there's probably at least 20 different ways to play them. So lots of material there. Now we said easy, we meant easy. And the other easy part is creating your own games. Um, recently I was with a group of teachers, um, teachers from the eTeacher Scholarship Program were here in Washington, D.C. And we gave them just five minutes. And I swear it was only five minutes, not a second more. Um, and they worked in groups of three or four to create their own games. Now I kind of expected that some of the teachers might not do it or um, some teachers might create the same game as some of the other groups or maybe not be able to agree. But I promise you, all of the 11 groups created games. They were all different and they were all brilliant. They were all really relevant uh, topics that teachers and students are constantly focusing on in the language classroom. I was blown away. I was like, 
I don't know why Kevin and I wrote these games when we have teachers out there who could write better games than we could. In this picture on the right, I was working with some teachers in India, and they are designing their own games based on the games that we played. And you can see they've got what is actually the lid of a pizza box. It's a piece of cardboard. Drawing a game on that, and that can be used again and again. That is an example of DIY. Do it yourself. Exactly. All right. So let's take a look at the existing Activate board games, and I think this might help us when we think about making new games. So here's a list of all of the board games and an example game square. So let's take a closer look at the first one, About Me. So and we've already played two of these games. i just like to point out. What would the world be better without and what someone does? Yep, yep. So those are just two of the 11 games that we have. Um, so the first game, About Me. One of the example game squares is I Know How To... So I want you guys to think about what level this game would be for and what language is being practiced. So here is the board game. And if I land on I know how to, for example, I could say I know how to cook Thai food. So I think this game is just more of a general getting to know you game. But to me, some of the sentence constructions are a little bit more difficult than others. So in terms of level, I think, for example, one of the more difficult constructions, one animal I wouldn't want to be is, so it might be a little bit tricky for beginners. So I'm actually going to say intermediate, because I think that some of these sentences might be a little tricky. But what if we have beginners and we want to play an about me game? How could we adapt this? One thing I know that's a little bit challenging for beginning students is the difference between I have and I am. So what if we focused our About Me game on just sentences that use that? For example, here's some example game squares that you could create. So you see in the square that you have um, just some, some terms, and then the student needs to decide how to finish the sentence using I am or I have. But of course, all of their answers will be different because it's about them. So in my case, I have two brothers and no sisters. I am 2.5 meters tall, I don't know. <laughs> and like, I am it's like 10 feet tall. a teacher. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not that tall. Sorry. I am 5 foot 4. So these three things would be squares on the game board, is yeah. that right? Yeah, oh. so those are new squares, and all of our squares would guide the students to either use I have or I am. Wow, Jenny is huge. All right, so that's just one example. So this game and some of the other games that we have here focus more on just general conversation practice, while some of the others focus on specific constructions, like this one, um, have you ever, oh, when. And the example here is have you ever traveled to another country. So we really are focusing on a specific um, sentence construction here. Um, so let's discuss what level this game could be used for and what language is being practiced. Here's what the game looks like. All right, so we see that someone's saying present perfect. Okay. So I think for level, this game could be played with, well, what do you guys think? What level do you introduce this language I see intermediate, definitely not beginner. Okay, intermediate. Mm -hmm. I see seventh grade, Good. intermediate, intermediate. Yeah, I said here maybe low intermediate or above. Um, and why do I say above? So how come I could play it with advanced? Because even if your advanced students are familiar with this language, these questions are open-ended. What does open-ended mean? It means that your students can speak as much or as little when answering the question. So there's an important part of this question, and it's, oh, when? Um, and that answer, that allows students to uh, give a more in-depth answer. So the answer from your low-intermediate student may look very different than your advanced student, but that's a good thing. 
All right, so let's talk about the language pra being practiced. I heard some people mention uh, the present perfect, but I prefer not to use those terms because I think it's just extra vocabulary that might um, that's for our students that doesn't necessarily help them in conversation. So, um, and also students could play this game without knowing the present perfect, couldn't they? How else could they play this game? They could also use the simple past, right? So this would be a gr great to use as practice or review or even to introduce a new grammar structure. But the key here is really to let students play and focus on fluency and see what they come up with. Let them experiment with the language. Many so, people in the chat box have been pointing that out. It's a great opportunity for students to practice. And I think that's the key here. If you want to do a grammar drill, design a grammar drill. Drill. Games are meant to be played. Right? Exactly. So, I mean, if the goal of learning a language is to communicate, let's see. As teachers, let's stand back and observe how well they can do so in a small group, how well they can communicate in a, in a real conversation scenario. Okay, so now it's your turn. Um, let's think of some different language functions or types of conversation that your students are learning this year. So give me some ideas here. They say practice makes perfect. I like that. Good. All right, so what are some different uh, language, like language structures that your students traveling, okay? Um, expressing regrets. Okay, so think Good. about how you could turn that into a board game. Sports, foods, movies. So those are all topics that we could have games just about specific topics. Shopping and ordering, so we could have um, students practice via board game on how to shop or order things, express likes and dislikes, hobbies, political systems, emotions. Wow, these are all great ideas. I think we could turn all of these into board games really sure easily. Could. All right, so in my class, um, I want my students to be able to talk about daily routines. So what type of language do students need to use to talk about daily routines? What do they need to know? Um, they need the present simple, okay? Present simple, modal verb, school things. All right. And so what are some things we could put in our game squares if we had a game about daily routines? What could we put in the squares? Vocabulary. What kind of vocabulary? On the desk? Easy words, time, home chores. Okay, so the key here is to remember that we don't ever want each square to just have one answer. We want students to use the language authentically and to make it personally personal. All right, so here is an example board game that I created about daily routines. And I've just created a few squares here. There are um, actually two sets. So I have this one and this one. The content is the same, they just look a little different. Which set would you use for lower level students? This one or this one? And which one would be more advanced? What do you think, Kevin? I think that this one that you're looking at now is easier for lower level because it provides them more language structure to use. It's right there in front of them. Exactly. I don't need to remember that do goes with dishes or take goes with shower, whereas here I would need to remember that. But students can also um, make this personal because in my case, I might say I always do my homework, but I think in Kevin's case, he would say he never does his homework. That's true. <laughs> so you can see that each answer would be completely different. All right, so now let's think of some other game ideas. What about practicing if I had? What type of game squares could we include with that game? So give me some example game squares for if I had. So if I had, if I had a million dollars. If I had, what else? One million dollars, I like that one. If I had a car, exactly. If I had a magic wand, okay, so here we have if I had a million dollars, if I had my own house, if I had an elephant. Kevin, if you had an elephant, what would you do? 
I would try to make the elephant happy, and that might require releasing him into the environment, but I'd also like him to be my friend. So. <laughs> All right, I see Teresa here says, how can you monitor if students are using the target language? Great correct question, Teresa from Macau. So we talked about that a little, and of course in some of these games we are structuring it so we're encouraging a, a specific type of response. But again, we mentioned that it's okay if students use different responses that aren't necessarily in the molds of the specific grammar structure that we're practicing because we're, we're practicing authentic communication here. Yeah, I'd like, ter, uh, Teresa talks about the target language. Are they speaking English or are they speaking the native tongue in the games? And I think that students understand inherently that a game is played with rules and it gives teachers a great advantage and they, the students understand one of the rules is that we learn English. The game also provides support language. In this example, if I had. So that's right there for them. I don't think they're going to use the native tongue very much. Sure. And if they use it a little bit, that's OK. They're exploring. Some other ideas are rules and laws. So what could we put in game squares here? I have recycle, spit, and steal. And here, what kind of language would we be practicing? Um, we could do, this could be should, shouldn't, for example. Or exactly. Yeah, modal verbs there. And then, how many do you know? Now, this is a different way we could play a board game. So remember, not only can you be creative with the type of language, the game squares that you're using, but you can also be creative in the way that you play games. And this one's a little bit different. So let's demonstrate. I'm going to roll the dice, and I rolled a two. So the challenge here is for me and the rest of my group to name as many animals as possible. We're going to go in a circle. And the person that says the last um, animal gets to move gets to go next. I see. So, so the order changes. Animals would be the second square on the game board, is yeah. that right? Okay. Alright, let's just do animals that start with A, because I think we could go for a long time if not. Okay. You start. Albatross. Arnvark. Uh, anteater. Antelope. Abalone. Alligator. Don't cheat. Don't look at their answers. <laughs> Elephant. <laughs> All right. So since I was the last person, I get to go next. So that's just another way you could try to play the game. All right. Let's move on. Interesting. Jenny, I've noticed something about these games, that they have the title written on the game, but they don't have all the directions written on the game. That's true. I wonder why they're like that. One thing is we don't want students to get too absorbed in, hey, we're reading the rules if they're written on the game. We want to encourage teachers to do demonstrations, and we want the games to be flexible so you can use different rules. Sometimes if you plant the game in front of students, they will just make up their own way of playing it, which I think is great. I agree. I think you've had that happen a few times, actually. I have. And then we invent whole new games based on how the students interpreted it. Yeah. So... We have a challenge for you, but we're going to tell you at the end of the webinar, but just stay tuned and get excited because we will have a challenge for the teachers joining us today. But I think it's time to talk about the other game in Activate. There's more? There is more. Great. This, as you can see, is called Picture This. This is a set of cards, and you're seeing the two sides of the cards here. This is one card with two different sides. The first way to play is very easy. You'll notice that the order of the words does not match the order of the pictures, right? So we could just plop this down onto the desk and ask students, a lower level, for example, match the words to the pictures. Great. But also, these are great conversation starters. You can give these cards to students, and they will talk for a long time. So you see here, you can do this in pairs or small groups. Um, one student is holding the card. So for example, in this case, Kevin sees the pictures. 
and Jenny is holding the cards and Jenny is looking at the questions. So I'm going to ask Kevin questions. Okay. Kevin, which animal on the card is your favorite and why? That's a really difficult question because I like, I really love giraffes and elephants. I'm going to go with giraffes today because when I lived in Africa, I always got a thrill when I saw a giraffe, no matter how many times I saw them. This giraffes is sweet. are amazing. Okay, I'm going to give the card to you, and now you ask me a question. Okay. Um, which animal would you like to speak to, and what would you say to that animal? Well, although elephants are my favorite animal, I think I really want to speak to a lion, because mm -hmm. I feel like his life is pretty impressive, especially the male lion, um, because they really, as they say, are the king of the jungle, and they don't have to do much, it, and they're, yeah. they're, they're they the king. They sleep a lot. They, people bring them food. I guess it does make sense that they're called the king, because they just lay and relax, and people bring them food. Not people, but lions. Um, so I think it's. Uh, I think I would like to talk to the lion. Yeah, Jody in Burundi, who's one of our English language fellows, has played this game a lot with her teachers there. We can see in the chat box that she loves this game. Okay, so these pictures or these cards are available for download on our website. Yali from Yemen points out again open-ended questions. Thanks for reminding us of that. These are open-ended. There's not one correct answer. So, and you could play this with small groups. Um, you could have different students asking questions or having the whole group answer the questions as well. Same with the board games. Picture this has variations. So there's a lot of different ways we can use these cards. This is just another variation and if you see at the top it says there's 13 additional games that are included with how to use Picture This, and I'm sure there's many more that you can think of. But we're going to show you just two other ideas. One is called ABCs. So here, you can probably figure out what we're doing, but if we have the vegetable card, we're going to first match broccoli with B, carrot with C, tomato with T, etc. And then we're going to try to think of other vegetables that start with each letter of the alphabet. So this is really a vocabulary based game. It can be played with any topic that you're studying um, and a way that we could get students very interested in this is to make it a competition. So have students work in groups of two, three, or four. Try to fill out the list and the first person to finish the list is the winner. So I think we should try this as a group. Yeah. But we're going to do this with feelings. So we've already filled out the six feelings that are included on this card, but we need to come up with the rest. So there's, I think, 21 uh, spaces still available, but we're going to do this in teams. So let's give it a try. Group work is always best for activities like this. Let's make the world, the webinar world, do this in groups. Okay, so we have four teams. We have, if your first name starts with A through F, G through M, N through S, or T through Z. Try to create a list of feelings with, uh, for each letter of the alphabet. Pay attention to your group to see that you're not all submitting for the same letter. Curtis, you be fair. And <laughs> we will be watching to see who wins. All right, so I'm going to watch the first two. Kevin will watch the second two. All right, so I see anxious. You don't need to tell us your name, just... Tell us um, some feelings that start with letters A through Z. T through Z has B down. Let's go for C. N through S is going very, ha very fast. Wonderful, excited, underwhelmed. I love that. Blue, Happy, good one, cool, Marina. Awesome, depressed, uneasy, excited, cheerful, frightened, lonely. Wow. I think it's going to be hard for us to pick the winner here today. Gloomy, jealous, uh, frightened, We're moderate. getting so many great words. All right, let's see. The first person to type a Z. Okay. Well, moderator Curtis. We won't count him. <laughs> Who else has a Z? 
Does anyone have a Q word? I like from Thailand, Bill says, extra happy with, with using an X. <laughs> I think we saw a Z, Z here. Zealous from Jiu in China. All right, so we're going to give the winning winner to Team 4. Zimbabwe. Is <laughs> I don't know if that's a feeling, but it does start with Z. All right, so we're going to look at one other game that is a variation for Picture This. And this game is called Same and Different. Now, that last one was just a word game. And word games are fun to do every now and then, right? Especially when we make a competition of them. We're going to go back to the kind of speaking and critical thinking activity. And you'll see the wide usage that's possible from these cards. Exactly. So this one is called Same and Different. Here are the instructions. You can download them from our website. We're going to demonstrate for you. So first, I want someone from our audience today to pick one of the four topics. And I'll go with the first one that's in the chat box. So pick one of these four topics. One of these four card types. Beverages. Right? All right, we're going with beverages. Now someone from the audience pick two items from the beverage card. So just two. We're waiting. So we're coffee and water. OK. So, Kevin, we're going to go back and forth and compare coffee and water until one of us can't think of a similarity. Oh, okay, we're playing same first. Same. Similarities first. Okay, good. Because differences is a great game, too, but we're going to start by playing same. Who's going to start, Jenny? I'll start. Okay, water and coffee. How are they the same? Um, water and coffee are the same or similar because people drink them in the morning. I drink water every morning. Okay. Do you? Um, when I remember, but <laughs> coffee is always first. Um, there, both of them are at least ninety percent water. Okay. Both of them. I'm taking one from the chat box. Don't have sugar in them, unless you put sugar in them. Uh huh. Good. I'm gonna say both of them are healthful. They're good for you. Some people are gonna disagree, but I think coffee is very good for me. It's good for me, too. Both are natural. <laughs> yes, Excellent they are. point. Um, both are thin liquids. Okay. They're not thick, like, you know, orange juice. Hmm. I'm going to say that I can't live without either one. That's a good one. Um, I'm going to uh, we can drink both of them hot or cold. Okay. Oh, I, I don't think I can think of any more. So I guess you're the winner that time. Yes! Kevin finally won a game. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the other way you can do this is to talk about the differences. And you can see, again, there's no real right answer as long as students are telling you what the similarity or difference is. Um, so there really there is some serious critical thinking that has to occur to play this game. And I would bet that you can think of many different games you could create by using just the pictures. On. Definitely. All right, so as I mentioned, these cards are on our website. Thank you, Aljona. In Kazakhstan, she congratulated me for winning. <laughs> you can download both all of the cards, all of the instructions, and the individual games that you can play with Picture This. All right, so I think we've played a lot today. So I think maybe we should start talking about some of the things that are on the teacher's mind about playing these games in their classroom. OK. I know some of you are thinking, well, it's really hard in my classroom. I, earlier we saw that some of you have 80 students. Some of you have 60 students. Am I right? I bet there's some that have over 100 students. I'm sure there are. Because if we're going to use board games or these Picture This cards, we're going to have to give these materials to the students, right? Everyone's saying yes, yes, yes. So I'm going to have to print 100 board games, all different? Well, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think any of our teachers are going to do that. So we're going to look at some of my class management tips for using games. Number one, always in groups, right? The way we've been showing you is kind of like a teacher in the front of the room. We're playing the games with 
all of you out there. But in reality, we want to do these in small groups. That's where students get the practice. So let's just say we're going to always do these in groups. So let's ask how many students you have in your classroom. I'd like to get some solid numbers and see, because I think that you guys have large classes. Let's go to the poll. Okay, look, we're going to take a poll here to find out how many students you have in your classroom. Okay. Let's see. Wow, actually. Big variety here. Some people have really small classes, or do they just click on the top one on the list? I think we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so the majority of people have 16 to 25. Those are very lucky teachers. I think that's a good sized class. And we have... Still, it's interesting to note that over 5% have 100 people in their yeah, classes. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, and so almost 30% have 50. All right. So I think we can kind of see that there's a huge variety. Again, that all of our classrooms are different and not one size will fit all. Yeah. For those of you with 25 students or less, I think this is really manageable. But you know what? I think you can do this with 100 students. Uh, I think you have done it with 100 students, actually. Yeah, 160 is my record. But um, it's not easy. But that's why we have these classroom management tips. Let's do the math, then. Let's just take a number of 50 students, OK? Now, it depends on the size of your classroom, of course. But we could group students into 10 groups of five students if we had 50, right? But I like a little smaller group, so as an example, we're going to use 11 groups of four students. And that means two more groups of three students. In total, that would give us 13 groups. 13 is my lucky number. Is it? Mm -hmm. oh, good for you. So let's look at a classroom. Uh, we'll answer this, please. Let's say we have 13 groups four or three students in each group. How many of these picture this game cards do we need for these 50 students? What do you think, global webinar audience? So 13 cards. OK, so some people are saying we just need 13 cards. Interesting, because Kamala in Azerbaijan says 16. And that's about the number that I would choose. OK. <laughs> OK, so 13, 15. Sorry, 13. I would have said. Since I know that there's 24 cards, I would have said 24 cards for each group of 13. But that sounds like a lot of cards. That would be a lot of cards. And in reality, teachers aren't going to get that many. And also, if we give student groups too many materials, we're going to lose control over the activity because they will be changing cards yeah, all the time. I, I would probably want to look at all of the cards. So right. it, it's good for each group to have one or possibly two cards if they're disciplined at a time. So many people are saying we need, someone's saying we need 555. <laughs> Some are saying 13. OK, we have 13 groups. But here's classroom management game tip number two. You don't need as many materials as you think. And many people are saying, yeah, we just need 13 cards. 13 cards could be a problem, because what happens when one group finishes? Are these 13 different cards, 13 the same? Well, here I've taken a part of the classroom. You might arrange your desks so that you have 13 groups. You can see there's only 12 there, right? But we've also got the teacher's desk. Let's use that. We can gather students around each base or desk. And the important thing is that we have a system for rotating materials. Notice. We're looking at a snapshot here of four bases where we would do this activity. We have four students standing, for example, around each desk. These are different cards. We need a system when one group is finished with their card to rotate that new material to another. This gives a lot of practice to students. 
Otherwise, if we just have one card for each group, they finish the activity, where do they go next? So would you designate a specific student to be the runner? I think that's one strategy that's very good. That way you have one representative from each group who can move the card when needed. Teacher can do it his or herself. I usually do it myself. Mm -hmm. But in up. a class of 100, it might be tricky. Then you, you need help from your students. And with training, they can do it. I have another question. Since yeah. these aren't board games, do we even need desks? Because I know a lot of our teachers can't move their desks around. Do the students have to play this sitting down? No, I don't think they should, uh, that they do. And also, that's why we have this tip. Think in terms of group bases for um, games instead of desks and chairs. We are often caught with the idea that we have to have students at desks with their chairs, and that's what a group is. But really, a group can be standing with the cards with the game boards, one student can have it in his or her lap on a board. On a chair, even. On a chair. As you can see here in this picture, uh, there's actually five groups of four students. And that's 20 students. That's a fairly small class. But we're just playing games on the chairs. It might be unorthodox, but it works. And so. When each group is working on a game, should we time it, as Jenny and I did with our game at the beginning of the course, uh, uh, of the webinar? You can use a timer. At the end of five minutes, everyone rotates. That's a good class management method. But then again, people might finish at different times. Chris, or what about fixed furniture? Fixed furniture? You can still have students stand around a desk you can take them outside. You can use the front of the classroom. You can use the side of the classroom. Yeah, so as Kevin mentioned, identify maybe 13 of the 50 desks as your bases and have uh, groups of three or four students stand around one desk. There's no problem for students to stand up. Yeah. I'm not saying it's easy. I've been in classrooms where it's been very difficult for me. But I have my final tip is why I will try this in any classroom, because it's about attitude if you're going to play games. If you think, I can't do this in my classroom, you're probably correct. You can't. But if you go in with the attitude that we will find a way, if we can't find a way, we'll make one, then there's always a way to do it. Where there's a will, there's a way. That's right. And I wouldn't be discouraged if the, if the first time you play games it's noisy or things don't go well, because that often happens. But we all get better when we do something more than once. I agree. I think there's students can be trained to do certain things. So they know, okay, after they've played a game five times, it's a different board game, but now they know how to play board games. Just as if you've ever seen kindergartners in a line, it doesn't really look like a line, <laughs> but by the time they're in third grade, they're pretty good at it. So it does take a little practice and training of your students. As Jody says, there's an initial investment in training, and that is true. Especially if you're doing something fun, students will realize we are going to behave because we want to do more games in the future. Exactly. So we have talked... Um, a little about these topics today throughout the presentation, but we know that they're still on your mind. Um, we are going to talk more in depth about these topics on the Ning, but um, if we have, if we want to address a little bit of this now, first the role of the teacher. Kevin, what should the teachers be doing during these games? Well, I have a definite idea, but I'd really like to see what uh, our webinar participants, hot correction, or does that mean not correct? All right, so someone says facilitator, so kind of making sure the games are, are working, I think that's monitoring. So what should the teacher be doing when students are playing games? A facilitator and observer. Managing Mood time. maker. <laughs> Mood maker. Time management, that's good. Encouraging. Or a student can also be assigned to that role. Coordinating, good. So yeah, I think these are all key. What would but you be doing, Jenny? I would be... Um, First of all, getting the game set up, 
possibly rotating games if I needed to assist students with that. Of course, listening to what my students are saying. That's, um, a, that's important. If, you know, if we are focused on, for example, the present perfect, and I notice that a lot of people are struggling with it, well, then maybe it's time to revisit and practice some more. Um, but I, I wouldn't really do a lot of correcting at that point. I think I would let students just play, observe. Um, you know, occasionally I might help a student along if they're struggling, but really I would be an observer. You know, when I'm playing games and running around the room facilitating and moving board games, I love to listen to students and I also like to contribute to the game. I don't correct them, I just love to hear what they're saying and I like to... Yeah, why not? The teacher could stop by one of the groups and roll the dice themselves and, and play a, a round. I think it's really important for the teacher not to interrupt a game for mistakes or for whatever. You can help students that are struggling. But remember, games are meant for playing. You want to do grammar? Make a grammar exercise afterwards. Okay. Games are to be played. But that doesn't mean that they're not learning because, again, um, we can marry those two things. Learning and fun can happen. We're not playing games just to play games. It's not, you know, let's play checkers at the end of class. These are language games, and students really are actually getting an authentic opportunity to have a conversation in English. So learning is happening. But not correct mistakes only for the target language, not the choice language. So we're... Um... How about, I hope that you will go onto the Ning and talk with each other about these topics because I think we will get great ideas for solutions to some of these problems on the Ning. Another one is error correction, and I think we sort of just covered that with the role of the teacher, that we should limit our error correction. And I think noise level is probably something that a lot of people are thinking about. They have a large class. Their, okay. their students are, or their classroom is right next to another classroom, so they don't want to disturb. What do you guys think about noise level? What are some ways we could um, think about that? So it shouldn't be noisy. Noise is very loud. Noise is okay. So in some cases, I think you might be lucky and you're in a place where noise is okay. But what if your principal doesn't like noise or your the classroom next to you complains. What do we do? As always, I think that there are a lot of possible solutions if we sort of think um, experimentally. One is we can ask students to be quiet and train them that way. We can ask them to whisper. Yeah, could we play these games in a whisper? Mm -hmm. I actually think that would be pretty funny. We can reward the groups that are the quietest in some way by giving them a certificate. If students like playing the games, they will follow your rules because it means they can do it in the future. They can play outside. Yeah, in some cases you might have a space where students can play these games outdoors. And if you just think that your students can't play quietly or in this specific situation it won't work, you can write. Have a piece of paper and have students write down their answers. That's true. So we're going to talk more about these on the Ning and we encourage you to do so as well. But we know that these things are on your mind. Um, so just think about them and think about how you can make it work in your setting. So just as a reminder, um, there are other components of the Activate game. There's two more parts. Guess what is another set of cards and word bricks. But we're going to learn more about these in the Activate Games for Learning American English webinar part two in 2014, so stay tuned, and we hope that the games we've given you so far will give you enough to work with until then. Yeah, so today's webinar has only discussed half of what Activate Games for Learning American English has to offer. All right, so do you remember this from earlier? Does everyone remember this challenge slide? Okay, well, we are going to invite you to create your own board games and share them with us. So the first thing you could do is download the board game template and create a, a game on the template. It looks like this. 
So all you would need to do is create a title and fill out the game squares. Or you could make your own. Um, you could create, wow. we had a very creative Indonesian teacher that made her own board game. Um, she used stamps to make the squares. She used a few markers. It's very colorful. That's um, beautiful. I like that much better than the computer printout ones that we sometimes use. Yeah, but sometimes, you know, I don't have enough time, so I use the computer printout, and the students still have a good time. Yeah. So I think both options are really great. So here it is. Let the games begin. The challenge is CYOBG, which means create your own board game. If you are up for the challenge, we want you to submit a complete board game either as a picture, a scanned copy. So if you create your own, like we saw the Indonesian teacher, you could take a picture or scan it. Or you can fill in a template on your computer and send it to us. All the details of the competition will be posted on the Ning after this webinar. And we will be selecting winners on December 18th. So we will post the instructions on the Ning. We will select